Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come before you tonight. We must praise your name because of what you've done for us, individually and collectively as a church. We bless your name because of the way you have been leading us and teaching us and speaking to our hearts. And as we have just heard from your children singing, speak to us again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we open our hearts before you. And we ask that your word will reach us at the point of our need in Jesus' name. Amen. Circumcise our hearts. Transform our lives. Help us to be the people you want us to be. In everything we do and in everything we say, may you receive the glory and through our lives and contribution to the work of the church, may the church be edified and may the church grow. Be with us and implant your word into our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have been studying from the Acts of the Apostles and we have been seeing the history of the church. We have been following the progress of the church up until this time. I want to remind you that the Lord had blessed the church in every way possible and in every way desired because the world had been evangelized and the power of the Holy Ghost and multitudes had been won to the Lord as um, the church was having a wonderful impact within the rank and file of the believers so it was also having a serious influence upon the world around. But let me show you what actually did it. You can put everything uh, into two different words. Number one is love, and number two is unity. The church was united, and the church was having a fellowship together, a fellowship of love, and it was a warm fellowship. You were called outside, and you came into the church. You became born again. Immediately, you were received into the open hands of the believers within the church. In Acts chapter 1, Verse 14, the Spirit of God has made this to be recorded for us. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. The one accord there is talking about their unity. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. But wait a moment. Chapters 1 and 2 record the stage of the church when the church was very small. Just about 120, we're told, they gathered together, they were united. And you know, sometimes it's very easy to keep the unity in the bond of peace within the fellowship of the church when the church is very small. I mean, you have a church just 120, 150, 200, and 300. It's sometimes easy. To remain united, although it's sometimes difficult if that church is small, but you know, they know one another so much that uh, you know they've been there together for so many years and a small church. You know, the secret of everybody, everything that is happening in every home, you know, and sometimes it's difficult for such small little congregations to be united. In any case, it was a small church in Acts chapters 1 and 2. And um, they remained united. But now it became a larger church because just in one day, 3,000 became converted. And we're told in chapter 2, verse 46, and they, continuing daily, with one accord again in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they did, they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. The Holy Ghost had just been poured out. And because the Holy Ghost had come with the um, flame that came to burn out everything undesirable in the, uh, in the church, they remained united. There was unity in the church. But then as they continued, we're told in chapter 4, verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, and of one soul. That means that as they were progressing, they were getting multiplied now, they were getting into their thousands, they still remained in unity. And um, not only spiritual unity, also uh, physical 
outward external unity. It wasn't an invisible type of unity that they had, you know, just united by the blood of Jesus Christ. They were also united, you know, in their love. They were united in their caring for one another. They were united in fellowship. They were united and the unity was visible. It could be seen. You knew that was a church, a large church, a united church, a praying church, a fellowshipping church. In Acts chapter 5, reading there in verse 12, and they had, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. You could see they said the same thing. They thought in the same way. They were going in the same direction. They embraced one another. They cared for, for one another. And you could see that unity. And of course, it affected the world around them. That's exactly what Jesus Christ had said before. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So then, in the early church, as large as the church was, there were two words you could never miss coming in when you came into that church. There were two things that was very important and significant you could never miss when you came into their midst. One was love. And two, it was unity. And that love made them to keep close together. And that love made them to be going ahead with the work of the Lord. It was so wonderful. I told you last week that within the rank and file of the believers, there was purity. But you know, purity cannot long remain if there is no unity and love. And you know, it's difficult to keep united if there is no humility. So you are now seen into the life of the early church. One, unity. Two, love. Three, purity. Four, humility. Because the humility was there, it was very easy to keep in love together. You try to love your brother, your sister without being humble. Is very difficult. You try to keep united with the body of Christ without being humble. It's very, very difficult. In fact, it's impossible. Because a proud heart is a critical heart. When you are not humble, when you are not submissive, and when you are not wanting to contribute and sacrifice your part to keep the body in unity and in love, your arrogance and your pride will have the better part of you. But you know, if you'll just become humble, it will be easy to love. Then you'll be contributing to the unity of the church and there'll be purity in the church. I told you, not only purity, there was power in that church. And you know, if you've been watching God very well, when a body of Christ or when a body of believers, whether in the Old Testament days or in the New Testament days, when they are pure, and loving and humble and united, there is something you will find. It becomes a ready channel for the power of God. But divide that body up. Slash it into pieces. Make them, instead of facing one another, instead of loving one another, let them throw the back at one another. Just, uh, you know, let them contradict one another and become divided. Let there be discord in their midst and the power of God will not be able to flow anymore. So what was the secret? The purity in the believers in the church, the love in the church, the unity in the church, the humility in the church, all made them to be channel of the power of God. And you know, in this church, if we want the power of God, if we want to become channel, large channel, of the power of God well we'll have to in every heart have love unity humility purity now I told you last week that even though they were pure and powerful that persecution came but then when the persecution came you know a united church can fight and it can be victorious when you are fighting within the ranks of the church a divided fighting church will not be able to fight the good fight of faith. 
But because there was fire in the church, warmth in the church, unity in the church, purity in the church, power in the church, love in the church, humility in the church, the persecution was nothing. All that the devil did came under their feet. It wasn't because, you know, they are different from us. Many of them will just be five feet, six inches tall. Many of them will just be poor men. Many of them will be messengers and servants where they were working. Many of them were jobless. Many of them did not have the necessary education in life. But beyond education, beyond refinement, beyond all the things you can think about in the world, if you can find these things I've been talking to you about in the church, you have them having the power to be able to resist any persecution that may come. Now, if you, as you study the Acts of the Apostles, if you want to really benefit the church, you'll be having these qualities in your own heart. Now, so far, so good. Love, and that was wonderful. Unity, it was just marvelous. The humility among them, you know, there was never any argument. The humility was just fantastic. And then as they went on, having that purity and power, and they were able to, so, they were able to subdue all persecution under their feet, the church was marching on. But now we come to chapter 6, and something happened. A problem came up. You remember last week I gave you six P's, purity, power, pollution that came into the church, number three. Then number four, God just followed up with a purging and uh, you know it cleared everything up again. And then there was, I told you, persecution. But I told you the persecution could not wipe away either the stand of the church or the power of the church. And I told you that even though these people were becoming popular, they did not allow either prosperity or popularity to remove their, their purity and power. But now there is another period that came into the church and this one was terrible. It was a problem. And uh, you'll see how the problem came in. I told you that the, the devil had tried to bring pollution, but the devil couldn't just match that church. The church kept on standing. I told you the world tried to bring in persecution, but the world could not stamp out the church. The church kept on standing, but now something was brewing from within the church, from inside the church, and it was a problem. And you know, look up at me here. The devil cannot destroy the church. The world cannot destroy the church. But listen to me, the church can destroy itself. There is no enemy outside the church that can destroy the church. The only enemy that can destroy a church successfully is the enemy within the church. Think about it now before I go on in the church. Let me talk to you, those of you who are married. You know, if in your marriage, as a family, husband and wife and the children together. In that family unit, do you know, if you have what I've been talking about, number one, love. Two, humility. Three, unity. You know, if you'll have all these, love, unity, and humility in the family, there is no enemy outside that family that can destroy that family. And of course, purity. That means that husband may be far away, a hundred miles, a hundred kilometers, or a thousand kilometers from the home. He is as pure as when he was with the wife. He has personal integrity outside the home, far away from home, as he has within the family circle. And you know, if that purity is there, and the Lord makes you a channel of his power, love, Unity, humility, purity, the power of God, obedience to the word of God. You know, if that is so, that there is no outside external enemy that can destroy that family. But you know, wife, you might be the greatest enemy to your own family. You might bring a problem to that family, a division to that family, a problem that you will not be able to overcome because, listen to me, as long as you are keeping that fight inside the family, there is no way you can fight an outside enemy. Husband, as long as you keep on the fight between you and your wife, there is no way you can be able to fight an outside enemy. Come back to the church. Now, you know, the church was there. 
and now a problem had started inside the church. How are they to handle this problem? Because it was to be a critical moment for the church. If this problem brought discord and division, the church will be weakened and the church will be hindered in its progress and the church will be paralyzed. But then, if they could overcome this sin that came into the church, that church will be stronger and stronger. Come with me to Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Linger on on that verse. You know, whenever we come for Bible study, we really come to study the Bible. And we're to study the Bible to affect every area of our lives. And I want you to think about the family again. Now, young man and young woman, sometimes you, you want to find out what makes a marriage work. What makes, what sustains a marriage? Because, you know, young people do not understand about marriage. If you are going to keep your marriage together, there must be sacrifice. From the moment, from the day you knew the will of God, there must be sacrifice. Because a house divided against itself cannot, will not stand. And uh, now, young man, you prayed. You've known the will of God. And you've uh, seen... Um, the people you ought to see about it because you cannot just catch that woman outside and just uh, bring her into your house. You need to inform your parents, you need to inform the church, you need to inform your friends and uh, you want to be properly married. But listen to me, the moment you find the will of God in marriage, you're building a home. And do you know, building a home is more difficult than building a house. You build a house with money, blocks, cement, sand that's a house. You build a home with love and that's, that's dearer than money. That's more scarce than money. It's easier to find money than to find love, young man. And you know, you build a home with love with humility, with unity with purity. And you know as you start that marriage as you have known the will of God and that uh, sister has said, yes I agree every step of the way as you are building that home there must be unity there must be humility there must be love there must be sacrifice and you must be able to give up your own petty petty ideas to build up that home mark it down you may have money if you don't have love you won't build up your family you may have money, you may have all the resources in the world. If you do not have humility, if you do not have what keeps the home together, you'll not be able to keep that home together. And woman, understand me. A spinster can talk anyhow. You know, a spinster is a free person. I mean, she is not, a, let me use this word, steady with anyone. She has friends, but... All those friends you can interchange and exchange them for any other friend at another time. But you know, Spinster, you've known the will of God and you have given your word to that brother saying, Oh yes, I will go on in the marriage. You know the first thing you should do after you have known the will of God in marriage? You should go back to your closet in prayer. And uh, shoot out your tongue and say, God, look at this tongue of mine. It is short, but it is sharper than any digger. It can dig a grave for the marriage and just bury the marriage right there. Oh, Lord, tie up this tongue and help me. Every time I come in, the, in front of this, my brother, that I've now given my word to tie this tongue up and let everything I say be of love and humility and unity and purity and let your power be present in our midst all the time. Sister, you'll keep the marriage together. But you start an argument the second week of that marriage proposal, you are getting buried before you are dead. Because look at that verse again. If you are getting married and I'm talking to you tonight, mark that word. Matthew chapter 12 verse 25. Jesus knew their thought. It starts in his thought realm. In your mind. 
You know, you have something against that brother. You have something against that sister. And you begin to think about it and think about it and think about it. And within your heart, you are dividing that marriage already. You are dividing that home already. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Let me talk to you about keeping the nation together. You know why the people in the government, authorities in the government, why all the time they speak in the papers, they speak over the radio, they speak over the television? You know why? Because communication leads to confidence. Because, you know, if uh, the authorities are not telling us anything over the radio, over the television, they know that a kingdom divided against itself will not be able to stand. That's why they'll give us every information. You know, they are doing this, and this is the reason they are doing that, and what, this is what they are planning, this is what they are doing for the economy, this is what they are doing for this other thing, because a nation or a kingdom divided against itself will not be able to stand. And you know, that is one of the reasons for Decree 20. They just told those newspaper men that, look, you don't arouse the public to say anything negative, anything bad, anything injurious against the government. And that has to be done in any progressive government. Because, you know, if those newspaper men will just begin to take their pens and begin to tear the nation apart with their pens, they'll make the nation to be divided against the other and that nation cannot stand. You see, if you don't know, if you don't understand the Bible, you can destroy your home, you can destroy your own nation yourself. And when, I've told you, when there is love in the nation, when there is humility in the nation, when there is unity in the nation, that nation becomes a channel for God to be able to walk through. And if you keep the nation together, the economy will come up in no time. So your home, or the nation, or your family, or the business that you are just racing up, getting together with a brother, and you are, you are in partnership with a brother, with a sister, in, a, in business. <laughs> Understand? It's, uh, it's easy to have a large capital and pump into that business. But you know, if you don't keep that business together with love, it's the same thing. Whether it is church or family or business or nation, it's the same thing. Keep it together. The love, the unity, the humility, and the purity. That means that you are honest in every deal. You are honest to fulfilling your promise in that, in that uh, business. And you make that business, if there is love and unity and humility, and there is purity, honest dealing. You make that business an open channel where God can pour his resources, and things will just be wonderful. Read that verse again, and think about it when you get home. Matthew chapter 12, verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom, every nation divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, I told you that a problem came into the church. Now, understand this. Problems are always there. Small church, small problem. Big church, big problem. That's why um, our brothers and sisters, they find it difficult to stay on teaching job. Because, you know, if you're a teacher, the higher you go, the easier it is. Because, you know, um, I've taught in primary school. And when I was teaching primary one, my, there was problems. You teach primary one. If you keep on teaching primary one, two years, three years, five years, you are a teacher. Am I right? Then I taught primary two. Then I taught primary three. I taught primary four, primary five, primary six, secondary one, two, three, four, five, HSC one and two. And then I came to university. I taught prelim. I taught year one. I taught year two. And the higher I went, the easier it was. Because the higher I went, the smaller my class became. And when I came in front of those uh, students wanting to study mathematics uh, in, uh, in their degree course, I just have about eight students, about 10 students, about uh, 15 students. And 
my, I just take my piece of chalk, walk to the class, and everything, I never sweated. But when I taught in primary school and secondary school, I really taught. I, I knew teaching was a hard job. And you know, that's why some of our sisters and brothers are looking for, they're trying to look for another work. If it were not for scarcity of work, some of them will leave the teaching employment. They know I'm right. Because the larger the class, the, the, the greater the problem. And follow me, the same thing in the church. You have only 10 members in the church. A small church, a small problem. And you have a 20 members in the church, still uh, you can accommodate the problem. But now your church becomes 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. If you still remain a pastor, you are called by God. You know, a pastor made an announcement in the church. And he said, I I'm going to show you the cause of the problem of our church next Sunday. So tell every member, I'll be showing you the cause of the problem next Sunday. And uh, that Sunday morning, they were 1,107 in church service. 1,107. When he said, now you want to know the problem of our church, who is causing the problem of our church, now come next Sunday, I'll be showing you. And my, the church was full next Sunday. You know, they told one another, everybody likes gossiping. Everybody likes to know that you are the problem. They are not the problem. And so they fill the church. You know how many they were in church that Sunday morning? 1,400 plus. They just came in large number. And uh, the pastor made a cardboard. He drew a hole in it. He put glass behind it. And he hid it near the platform. He said, now, you want to know the problem of the church? I want you to match past uh, that uh, cardboard and uh, look into it. You'll see the problem there. And he saw their faces reflected. And he told them, you are the problem of the church. You know, that's the real problem. And uh, God knows there could be problems in the church, but he has given us a solution. What's the solution? Love. Humility, unity, purity, and then the power of God will continue to flow and the problem in the church will be solved. Come on with me. Acts chapter 6. I'm looking at verse 1. Now, let me talk to you. Now, some of you are looking at the resource saying, the way you are talking, will you be able to finish the outline? Listen to me. It is not finishing the outline that matters. If you get only one sentence, that's enough for you. What's the use if I run through the outline and then you don't know how to keep your family together? What's the use if I run through the outline and you do not know how to keep your business together? I'll be doing you no good. We have not come here for certificate or theology. We came in here so that our lives can be better. Am I right? So let's slowly go on. After all, if I don't finish it today, you are coming back next Monday. Aren't you coming back? Acts chapter 6. Now, Zona leaders, are you there? Let me have a yes if you are there. I'm going to show you something. Now, you know, sometimes you see this outline and you say, Man, how do you prepare this outline? And you think uh, this man is a tough guy. He just uh, picks up a Bible passage and he writes multitude, murmuring, maturity, men, and everything will rhyme together. Now let me show you the secret. You want to know the secret? Acts chapter 6 and, and see how, to, how we prepare outlines. I'm reading from verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, I see an M there. I pick it up. There arose a murmuring, I see another M, I pick it up, of the Grecians against the Hebrews because the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And then the twelve called the multitude, I see another M, I put it up. I just, you know, continue to write, write those words that strike me and, uh, you know, and they start in the same way. And it says in verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, it is not reason, that is not reasonable, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out from among you seven men. I see another M, and, and I put that down. Men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. 
but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry. That's another aim, and I put that down, to the ministry of the world. And the same please the whole multitude. That's another aim that appeared before. And he chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed and laid their hands, uh, they laid their hands on them, the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied. That's how I am there again. In Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. You see, if you are preparing a Bible study outline. And you read over that passage. You read it over and over. Over and over. Until you begin to feel the central truth and the running flow of that passage. And as I've read it to you, you've seen the multiplying of the converse in the church. You have seen the murmuring in the church. You have seen the multitude of believers. You have seen the men that were to be chosen uh, to now take care of the work. And you have also seen the ministry of the word that the apostles were willing to addict themselves unto. And already the outline is forming. Now you ask yourself, these multitudes, what are they doing? These multitudes, uh, who are they coming to? They are coming to Christ. So you put that down as multitude in Christ. And then the murmuring, where was it taking place? Right in the congregation. And now the men, what men were, what type of men were they looking for as they gave the qualifications? You know that they were men that were surrendered and yielded, and they were men that were just devoted to the things of the Lord. What's one word just for that? Consecration. So you have men of consecration. And now these uh, apostles. What's the difference between them and the new babes in Christ? It's in one word, it's maturity. And so you have the four parts of the outline. Multitude in Christ, murmuring in the congregation, maturity of church leaders, and the men of consecration. Now that may help you next time you want to prepare an outline. Now let's go on to Acts chapter 6. I'm looking at the first part in verse 1. The Lord had been working with them. And um, it was a large church. And it provided wonderful opportunities in fellowship. Let's read the first part of verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples multiplied. Stop right there. You know, in the past, there had been winning souls. I told you before, and you knew this before. That in the very first day when the Holy Ghost fell, they had 3,000 that came into the church. And... Um, Another time they had 5,000 men without counting children and women. So the church now was multiplying. And eventually they couldn't even count. They just said multitude, multitude. But then as I've told you now, the larger the church, the more the problems. And if you belong to a large church, a large church, if you open your eyes very well and you like to look for problems, you will see problems. And in fact, you know, human beings are so perfect in finding out problems. Because even when there are no problems, if a human being wants to find a problem out, he will find it out. Why? You see, it's not very difficult in the world in which we live to make your hand dirty. You know, you can pick up anything you want in the world or on the earth. Underneath you where you are sitting, if you start digging, you can dig up water. You can even dig up iron, dig up gold, dig up precious metals and precious minerals right where you are sitting. But in that same place where you are sitting, if you like, not to dig for water, not to dig for gold, and not to dig for precious minerals, you can dig for dirt, for dirty things. And you won't have to dig long enough before you have the dirty things. So actually it depends on what you are looking for. You're looking for dirt, you can dig it up. You're looking for minerals and water, and you can dig it up. And so, in this large congregation, there, there was a problem. Now, let me show you why the problem was there. You know, the apostles were not angels. They were men. Because they needed to preach. And when the church is small, preaching is easier. 
when the church is large, preaching is difficult because you want to preach to be able to reach everybody in the congregation, meet the need of everybody in the congregation, and speak to the need of everyone. And because the congregation is, was large, the needs of the people were large, and it was a great task preaching unto them. Now, teaching was another thing that the apostles needed to do. And because it was a large congregation of a mixed multitude, many people not having the good background that they ought to have, you needed to teach in a patient way, in an orderly manner that will make the teaching to be relevant to the people and make um, what you are saying to be applicable in their life. And so the apostles needed to preach and to teach and to minister to the needy. And also, you know, they needed to prepare for meeting the authorities because they will be in the middle of a message and the authorities will send officers to them to call them to come and explain an action they are taking uh, before. And, you know, uh, these religious officers and authorities were always calling them and disturbing them. Now you think about that. Think about that. The preaching work, the teaching work, the ministering to the needy and to the poor, and preparing to answer questions from authorities and to preparing to go to the prison in any moment. And yet, you know, in all that, they still needed to meet the needs of their families, raise up their children, take care of their wives, and still give some fellowship and love to their wives, as well as developing the praying ministry. The praying ministry. Now, look up at me here. You may not understand for an apostle. You may feel that, you know, uh, the power the is there and everything is there. But developing a praying ministry is as difficult and as taxing as developing a preaching ministry. And when you have to do everything together, it's very, very difficult. You know, the members of the choir will understand because an um, instrumentalist said this. I mean, a real instrumentalist who has gone very, very far. He said, if I fail to practice in one day, I will know it within myself. If I fail to practice in one week, my enemies will know it. My critics, those who criticize the classical pieces I play, they'll know it. And if I fail to practice in, um, in one month, the public coming to see the concert in which, I, in which I perform, they'll know it. Think about it. I fail to practice in one day, I know it myself. I fail to practice in one week, the critics will know it and they'll comment. And I fail to practice in one month, the public will know. It's the same with the praying ministry. And you fail to develop it and to dig deep and to dig down and to face the praying and to wait upon the Lord in one day, you'll feel the absence. So we'll know it in yourself. If you fail in one week because of activities, because of every other thing you have to do, the critics will know it. And if you fail in one month, the congregation will know it. And so it was difficult. These people preparing for a preaching ministry, a teaching ministry, ministering to the needy and preparing to meet the authorities and praying and meeting their family needs and every other thing. It was a difficult job. The challenge was great for the apostles, you know, yet unknown to them. They were doing the best they could, bringing the converts in, developing the members of the church, and many, many things were going on unknown to them. Some members of the congregation had been neglected in the daily ministration. But you see, that was a problem. Now, how were they to face that problem? And you can tell from what I'm saying. You know, a large church like this, it's a challenge, wonderful challenge, having to, you know, do this work. But then uh, you understand that because of the various areas of the work, that's why the Apostle Paul will say, pray for me. He'll write to the Romans and he'll say, pray for me. He'll write to the Philippians and he'll say, pray for me. He'll write to the Ephesians and he'll say, pray for me. Every, every set of people he wrote, he was asking for their prayers. And he'll write even a simple letter to an individual. And he'll say, I'm sure by your prayers I'll be released from this imprisonment. Because the work is so taxing, the work is so demanding, so the apostles needed the prayers of the people, and it is so today that the congregation still ought to be praying for the leadership in the church. Now, let's see the problem that came up. It's in Acts chapter 1, but Acts chapter 6, rather, verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. 
Now, think about the church of that time. They had young men. You can tell because it was the young men that came and he wound an ass up when he died and Sapphire up when, he, when she died and he went to bury. So there were young men. No doubt there were women, young women, still happily married to their wives. But then in that church, there, were a great, there was a great number of widows. Widows. And these widows did not have husbands that would take care of them. And um, in the daily ministration of distributing food, distributing clothing material, distributing a number of things to meet their needs, they had been neglected. And this was unknown to the apostles. Now, before I go on, into the problem in the church, in the murmuring in the congregation. I must have to run you through some verses of the Bible. You know, a church, whether small or large, and listen to me very closely, a church must take care of the widows in the church. Not only the widows in the church, the church must take care of the poor people in the church, and the church must take care of the needy in the church. The needy, the widow, and the poor. The church has it as the duty, the responsibility to take care of them. And this is one of the major reasons we have divided into zones in this large church. So that the needs of the people will be made very close to us. And um, zonal leaders, you are there. Area leaders, you are there. House fellowship leaders, you are there. Now, we must uh, pay attention to what I'm saying because if we fail in the taking care of um, widows and the needy and the poor, the church has failed the congregation, the church has failed God, and the church has not done what it ought to do. Now, listen to me. The need of the church will always be there. Building a tabernacle, a large uh, auditorium like this is a gigantic type of project. But listen to me. You are building that auditorium for the people. What if the auditorium is built and the auditorium is fine and the auditorium is just the first and number one in Africa in the, in the complex, in the composition, in the structure, in the beauty and everything and yet the people within that congregation, the, the people under the roof of that auditorium, they're dying away because of hunger and they're perishing because of poverty. The point is, building will be going on anytime. And uh, if there is anything that is number one, number one, in the heart of a pastor, in the heart of an apostle, the number one is not the physical building. The number one is the real church. The number one is the real people. The number one is the people that are poor. And if there is no other way, listen to me, if there is no other way of taking care of the poor and the needy, <laughs> the church will have to just divert all the funds. Instead of raising up a physical building, you just have to divert all the funds to taking care of the poor and the needy. Come with me to the Bible. In um, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy. I'm reading chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and uh, to, require their pa to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number. Under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported for of for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if, they, if she has diligently followed every good work. And in verse 16, if any man or woman that believeth as widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. That verse 16 is telling you that if the widow in the church has relatives in the church, let those relatives take care of that widow. 
That means provide accommodation. That means provide food. That means provide clothing. That means provide the necessities of life for that widow. But if the widow in the church does not have the relatives that will take care, then the church, listen to me, the church has to take care of that widow. How do we do that? Galatians chapter 6. Verses 9 and 10. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as see, therefore, have opportunity. Let us do good unto all men. Underline that in your Bible. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. You know what that is saying? That is saying you don't wait for me as your pastor before you take care of the needy, of the poor, of the widow. Living in your zone, living in your house fellowship, living in your area, as soon as you see that need, that there's no food. As soon as you, are, you see that need, that man or that woman has no accommodation. As soon as you see that need, that that man or that woman is out of job and is a child of God, she is a child of God, you step into that need immediately and you do something very, very quickly. You don't need permission from your house leader before you will help. You don't need permission from area leader, house, uh, from a zonal leader before you will help a person that has a need. In fact, you know, if you're a real child of God, and a member of the church of God, a real good church. Every time you see a need in the house of God, in the household of faith, your heart will be, will be going forth in compassion. You want to do something. Now in uh, Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. And I'm reading there from verse 17. He that has pity on, upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And that which... He has given, will he pay him again? You see, when you have mercy, when you have pity upon the poor who is not able to meet uh, the necessities of uh, taking care of his family, who is not able to meet the necessities of caring for her children, or maybe she is not with her husband he, he, uh, at this time because of a particular problem that had caused separation. Or she has not been properly married and, and she's in difficulty. And therefore she is poor, she is needy. Or there are widows uh, that we need to take care of. If you lend, if you give, you are lending unto the Lord. And the Lord will become your supply, as I said yesterday, and your source, and your security, and your sufficiency. But you know, if you just tighten up your, your bowel of compassion, if you tighten up your heart of mercy... The blessing of the Lord will be restricted in your life. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 7. Deuteronomy 15 verse 7. If there be among you a poor man, of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates, in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, Thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. He is a brother. He is one of us. And God wants to supply his need. How, do, how will God do that? Through you and through me. You know, sometimes uh, you will know that in your own house you have um, food enough and to spare. And you will know that you have... Um, much uh, things that uh, you can share with other people and uh, we, that's why we ought to visit one another you don't, you, don't, you don't just stay at home reading Bible alone, reading Bible alone what are you reading Bible for? are you not reading the Bible to be able to minister to other people? now there are needs around you Get up. there is a time for everything there is time for reading Bible there is a time for praying there is a time for visiting one another and they seeing the needs of one another. And when a brother is poor, look up at me here. Don't be a judge. Don't say, well, maybe he's not following the Lord properly. How do you know? Don't say, well, maybe the Lord is uh, punishing him for the sins he committed in the past. How do you know? When a brother is poor, a sister is poor, uh, you are not to look at uh, what you don't know. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us. The, the reason for his poverty is a secret thing that belongs to the Lord. Leave that with the Lord. What is the thing that is revealed? It's poverty, it's need. But you won't know that if you don't visit him. And when you see that, your heart must reach out in compassion. Your heart must reach out in love and in mercy. 
and you must not harden your heart against him. Look up at me here. You know, if a sister has just put to bed having a child, and uh, the rain has begun to fall, and it's cold, it's chilly, and uh, that sister has um, maybe seven children already, and now has another child, the eighth one, well, uh, you might say, why is she uh, bringing forth an eighth child when she knows that she has seven children already and, um, and she knows she doesn't have much? That's not your problem. The secret thing belongs to the Lord. Leave that secret. Leave that with the Lord. The thing that is revealed is that already she has seven children and this is an eighth one and she is poor. And you don't want the cold to snatch away this new child. Take care of that child. That's, your pro that's the problem. Solve it. But leave the secret things. Now, a brother has been foolish enough to put all his resources in business. He had about 3,000 naira. Put everything in business and because of not studying business practices, everything has gone away in the drain under the, under the bridge. And now he is penniless. Well, why, did, why was he so foolish? As to put all the 3,000 in business, why didn't he just save some for the care of his family? That's a secret thing. Leave that with the Lord. The thing that is revealed is that he has put himself into this problem. Whatever secret reason it is, why he got into that problem, leave that alone. Take care of the problem that you see right now. Don't let his family be scattered when there is no work and there is no food and there is no sustenance. That's our responsibility taking care of the needy, of the, of the widows, and of the poor. Let me read verse 8 to you. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need, in that which he wanted. Beware, beware, that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, that means a year when they were to leave all their farms without cultivation. That was a sabbatical year. A year when they were to release all their servants. And they were feeling that, well, since the seventh year is coming, we're not going to be able to have much next year. We're not going to be able to keep our servants next year. So we must have a lot of reserve for ourselves. So beware that there be not a thought in thine wicked heart, saying... The seventh year and the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be seen unto thee. You see that? You say you are saved, you are not committing sin, a real child of God, but you know the tears of the poor become sin for you. The tears of the needy become seen on you. And the tears of the widows become seen unto you. And you think the church shouldn't talk about it? If such, if it is so serious that God says, if the widow, the needy, the poor will cry unto God, God will charge it as sin against the church. That's why we should talk about it. You know, it's easy for a zonal leader to say, oh, I thank God. Recently, I bought, uh, you know, concordance, and I bought a Bible dictionary, and I bought, uh, I bought uh, a book of teach yourself uh, how to learn Greek, how to know Greek in just one year. And now I am progressing in the Lord. I'm reading my Bible. I'm now very, very effective and dynamic. And when I challenge all those house fellowship workers, oh my, they just get into action. And you know, Zona Leader, if you are neglecting the poor, the widow, and the needy in the zone, no matter your knowledge in the Bible, no matter your power in praying, it becomes sin unto you. And you know this Syria leader? We're not to go around and just see, the, just see the members of the house fellowship looking for who to discipline. That's not why you are an area leader. Leave that area alone. Don't specialize in discipline. Specialize in contributing for the, for the needs of the poor. Specialize in taking care of, you know, the women that have no way of sustaining their families. Specialize in taking care of even the workers. And, you know, sometimes uh, zonal leaders understand this. Because Anosha may not be a, a member of, a, an active member of a house fellowship. And Anosha is in need. And you say, well, um, she is Anosha or she is Anosha. There is nothing I can do. I'm not, um, I'm not in charge of, of the Osha. Well, 
Number one is a member of the church. Number two is living in your zone. And those two things coupled together will make you to be able to take care of that individual. And you have to do that to the limit of your strength. And when you exhaust your strength, you come to the ministry and the ministry must see what to do. M-U-S-T, must, must, must see what to do. And so you can see what we're saying. If we study our Bibles are right, we must take care of the widows, of the needy, and of the poor. Now, let me look at um, verse 10. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved. When thou givest him, because that for this sin, the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy work, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto for the poor shall never cease out of the land. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. What does that mean? The church must have a continual program of taking care of the poor. Because the poor will always be there. Not the same set of people. As you are helping some poor people and you are putting them on their feet and they are getting out of poverty, there are other people that are attracting your attention who are poor in the church, who are needing the church. As you are taking care of some widows and those widows are properly taken care of and maybe you give them a little amount of money to, be, to establish them in a little business to carry them on and the church is still enlarging and many converts are coming to the church. Another widow is coming into the church again. So you are taking care of some widows and some widows and some poor people and some needy people are graduating from the school of poverty and some other people are getting into the school and therefore the poor will never, never cease from the land. That means that there must be a continuous, a continual program of taking care of the poor in the church. Verse 11, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee. Underline that word command. It's a command and to disobey it is sin. Sin on the pastor, on the workers, on the zonal leaders, sin on the whole church. I command this sin. Thou shalt open thine hand wide. Underline the word wide. You know, sometimes we take care of the poor, but we do it grudgingly. But God says that's not how to do it. A good church a spirit-filled church, a church that is really following the Lord, he must, uh, the church must take care of the poor and the needy and the widows in such a cheerful way. It's a wonderful privilege. And you know, when somebody is poor in your zone, and um, he happens to be coming along, you know, every time you see him, if there is anything in your heart that is angry, that is wrathful, that is unhappy, saying he's coming again, you are not opening wide. You are bearing grudge. You are doing it unwillingly. You are not cheerful about it. You are not happy. You are not counting it as, as a privilege. But you know, if you are a real child of God, in your zone, in your area, every time you see a needy person, a poor person, or a widow coming, and uh, even without his talking or her talking, there is an opening wide. And your heart will open as the flowers open to the morning light. And you'll want to take care. You'll joyfully, cheerfully want to do it. And thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to the poor, and to the needy in thy land. We've seen the Bible. We must carry it out. Now, I told you I may not be able to finish the outline. And um, you are coming next week. Aren't you coming? Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Now, obviously, all these things I've been talking about, they have been missing in the church, one way or the other. But I told you that we cannot blame the apostles altogether because uh, the load on them was just too much. Uh, the task was a great task. What they were to do, it, um, it demanded men of courage, men of strength, and men of integrity, and men uh, of balanced character to be able to do it. And because of that, the widows unknowingly had been neglected in the daily ministration. And now, verse 1 again, Acts chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Stop right there and look up at me. Let me explain this to you. Now, they were all Jews, and they were in Jerusalem. But the difference is this. Some of them were called 
Hebrews. Because they had been living in Jerusalem all their lives. They had been there all the time. Others were called Grecians because they were Hebrew people too, but they had lived a long time in Greece and they spoke the language Greek. And also they had been living in various parts of the world where they spoke Greek. And when they came for the revival, when they came for the Pentecost, at the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and the power, um, you know, just exploded in the church. These were among the people that got converted. And instead of going back to where they were before, they stayed in Jerusalem. And they were, you know, fellowshipping with the church. And so you had uh, the people that were, you know, totally there. And you had other people that were living in other parts of the world before. But now they were in Jerusalem. And they were part of the church together. Now... Um, a type of a jealousy among the Hebrews and the Grecians, apart from Christianity. Now, they were, when you were not converted and you appeared in town and they knew that you are being sort of a foreigner in your home country, they would look down on you. These were the people, even though they were Hebrews, they had gone away for a long time and they were now speaking Greek, their wives and their children, they were all speaking Greek. They have come back to Jerusalem to settle down, but they were looked at as foreigners within their own country. And the Jews were very proud, the Jews who had never gone out. They had been in the city Jerusalem, that's the city of God to them, and they were proud about it. And now they were converted. The Jews, the real Jews, Hebrews of the Hebrews, they were converted. And the foreign Jews were also converted, and there was unity in the church. And it happens that the widows who were Grecians were now neglected. You know what came in? A suspicion that maybe the apostles were partial. Because the apostles were taking care of the widows who were, Jer who were in Jerusalem all the time. But these uh, Grecian widows had not been taken care of properly. And some of the Grecians that heard about it, they started to murmur behind without telling the apostles what had happened. But then, what should we do about the problems? Whenever we see any problem, the question is, what should they have done? When they saw that the Grecian widows were neglected, let me just uh, run through and tell you what they should have done. Next uh, week, we'll um, get more into it. One, they could have reported in a humble way to the apostles that they knew that they were knowingly overlooking this important thing. And you know, whenever you see a problem in the church, this is what you should do. You should, in a humble way, report that problem to either the zonal leader or whoever is in position to be able to take care of that problem. One, you are not approaching it with a judgmental attitude. You are not judging anyone. You are in a humble way, in a loving way, in a spirit of unity and spirit of peace. You are making a report, a formal report of that problem. But that means this. You never open your mouth to discuss that problem with another person. Because problem is like leprosy. It spreads when you, when you let it out of your mouth. It is like a contagious disease. It will spread, and uh, when the problem spreads, it will destroy and divide the church and paralyze the church. Therefore, you never talk about it with anyone. You never open your mouth to contradict or to, uh, to criticize the leadership of the church. But you will humbly report it to the leadership. Number two, you, they could have comforted those widows when they saw that they were neglected. You know, they could go to them and sympathize with them, assuring them that, you know, widows, the apostles love you. We know they love you so much. Build up the image of the apostles be before the widows and assure those widows that uh, the apostles are so kind-hearted, they love everyone, and they're willing to take care of the problems of everyone and quieting the widows down. And, you know, when you see a problem in the church, sometimes our Zona leaders have... Uh, unknowingly neglected the needs of some people. What do you do? You don't go to those people and blow up the flame. You don't go to those people and worsen the problem and say, well, I know that Zona leader is always like that. What should you do? You go to those people having problems and you comfort them. 
and you sympathize with them and you build up the church and you build up the zona leader and you build up the pastor in the face of those people so that they will not have a critical attitude or spirit. But you know, if you go to those uh, widows that are neglected and you say, well, we know that the church is always like that. We know that they are partial. Well, you make yourself a judge. And also you'll be dividing the church. You'll be doing something that is evil. Now, number three. Temporarily, they could have met the need of those widows out of their own resources. You, you said, uh, did they have resources? Oh, yes, they had. Even though uh, many people have sold many things. But they were distributing to to everybody and out of the distribution that came to them they could have met the needs of the widows in a temporary measure in a temporary way waiting for the time the church will meet the needs of those widows and it will solve the problem uh, you know if we have a problem with uh, members in the church now it's a way you can help uh, while they've been looking for uh, the pastor to pray for them and it's been difficult to get a card for one week for two weeks and for three weeks and now they are grumbling what do you do when you know about that problem you go to them and you say well you must understand this is a large congregation it's so difficult for him to see everybody and you comfort him and you report it to the people that can solve the problem and then you say well but what's your problem are you sick okay i can pray with you and the Lord can answer my prayers. He will answer the prayer of our leader. And you show in the passages that talk of a uh, united prayer that if two of you shall agree as, as touching anything that you ask, that the Lord will answer. And in that way, you are a problem solver in the church. Number four, they should have stopped those who might have started gossiping. But they didn't do that. They continued in the gossiping. But you know, to, in a real church, in a good church, where there is the love and the unity and the purity and the humility and the power of God flowing, what you should do is, every time you see a gossip brewing up, coming out, your responsibility is to quench it right at that point. Anywhere it may be. Anywhere it may be. That is the work of everyone in the church. And that is what they should have done. When they saw those uh, widow women uh, murmuring, when they saw those uh, uh, Grecian widows murmuring and saying, well, we've been neglected, we're never able to have our rights in this church, and other people are taking care of, here we are, we're dying with hunger, we're dying in poverty, they should have called them and they should have said, now, don't bring in politics here. Eh? This is a church belonging to God. Stop that gossiping and we'll, we'll look into the problem and the problem will be solved and even if you will give everything you have to those widows so that the gossiping can stop and so that the problem will be solved, you should do it as a sacrifice and you'll be building up the church of God. And then, five, they should have prayed for those apostles. Knowing the weight and the load of responsibility on them that no human being could possibly handle the work the apostles were handling without strength and wisdom, without uh, the special grace of God. What they should have done is just to go on their knees and begin to pray for those apostles. They didn't do that. And you know, in the church here, that's our responsibility. Praying for the pastor, praying for the other workers, praying for the zonal leaders, instead of criticizing Instead of wanting to, you know, pull the roof of the church down because you have a little problem, you should be praying for the leadership of the church. And, you know, if we'll take all these things to heart that I've talked about today, I believe that what the Lord has started in this church, he'll continue it in Jesus' name. Amen. There will be problems. But then, when those problems are there, what are you to do? Report it at the earliest time possible to the leaders. Report it in humility. Report it without taking sides. Report it without adding to what the problem is. Report it as it is and do it in all humility and in all love. Number two, comfort those who are having the problems so that they don't have a critical spirit against the church. And three, help those who are having those problems so that what they're looking for from the church is supplied by you, a member of the church. And four, stop the gossiping where it is, right there. And five, every day, on your knees, be in prayers for the pastor, for the workers, 
for all the people responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the church. If we do these things, the work of God will progress in our hands. Rise up and let us pray. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. In whichever way you have been guilty of contributing to the problem in the church, why not confess it to the Lord? In whichever way you've been guilty in neglecting the needy and the widows and the poor in the church, why not confess it to the Lord? In whichever way you've been gossiping or murmuring, why not confess it to the Lord? Now you know what to do. You know what to do. When there is a problem that comes to your notice in the church, you know what to do. Take positive steps. Solve the problem. Be humble. Be loving. Let there be unity in your heart. Together with the body of Christ. 